You can start, Artie. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name's Artie Das, and I'm a consultant psychiatrist in Rotherham, and I'm also the specialist advisor to the Royal College of Psychiatrists on foundation training. Um, I'll be chairing today's webinar, um, and I'm really pleased that we've got some great speakers talking to today about applying for core training uh, and to answer um, any questions you might have. Um, I'm just going to go through some quick housekeeping before we get started, uh, just to remind everyone that uh, today's session is a Zoom webinar, so um, there's a question and answer section and also a chat function. If you have any questions as we go along, please can you put them into the Q&A uh, section rather than the chat function, we'll be able to pick them up from the Q&A section and try and make sure that your questions are answered. You can put comments or anything else you, you want into the chat function, but questions and things that you want us, uh, me to address with the panellists into the Q&A um, box, please, if that's okay. Um, we've had a lot of questions already um, and we're gonna try and collate them um, and try and make sure we address any of the major themes that are uh, going through this. However, if we don't get round to answering your question, we are going to be um, collating them all and uh, putting a list of frequently asked questions and answers on the website afterwards. Now, if you've got any particular questions about your personal circumstances, anything specific to you um, that might not be appropriate for sort of a large audience, please feel free to um, email the Royal College or Northwest Recruitment um, with details of um, what your question is. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to be uh, introducing first Claire Kerswell, who's the Head of Speciality Recruitment and Regional Recruitment Lead North for Health Education England Northwest. Claire's the Head of Speciality Recruitment for Health Education England, and her team um, has been managing and running national recruitment since 2013. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Claire. Thanks very much, Claire. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about applying to um, core psychiatry um, training for August 2021. Um, that also incorporates in um, ST1 Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, which is a run through pilot. Um, so can I have the next slide, please? Um, so I'm just going to cover um, what's different about 2021 recruitment. There'll be a quick overview of the process and what kind of posts are involved. Then I'm going to talk about um, eligibility requirements. Um, some things you'll need to bear in mind when you're completing the application form, um, a bit about the multi-specialty recruitment assessment, um, then finishing off with a bit about preferences and offers, and then some key dates for you. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so first of all, I think as probably most of you are aware, recruitment to core psychiatry for August 2021 is radically different from previous years. Um, and that's mainly because um, we're in the midst of an ongoing um, pandemic. Um, so this process has been agreed because it's going to allow us to successfully complete recruitment to core psychiatry training, um, despite the quite difficult circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, so to be really clear, there won't be any face-to-face -face or online interviews for core psychiatry for August 2021 um, recruitment. Um, and additionally, there's no requirement for applicants to provide any portfolio evidence or anything along those lines to support their application. Applicants will be ranked using the MSRA only, um, which is a computer based test, and I'll come back to that later. Um, the reasons for that are that MSRA is a reliable and valid way of assessing a large number of applicants in a standardised way with limited clinician and administrative resource. Um, it's also globally accessible um, and it can be delivered um, both remotely and in person if it needs to be. Um, the MSRA has been used in core psychiatry for a good number of years and it's fully evaluated um, and we know that there's a really good strong correlation between the MSRA itself and how um, applicants previously did when we were running face-to-face -face, um, interviews um, and that also applies um, for the kind of communication elements. Um, there's also some evidence that it predicts um, how people go on to, form, to perform during their um, core psychiatry training um, and then finally this is the process for August 2021 
we don't know right now what will happen um, for 2022 or beyond. Um, so this is just about August 2021, if that makes sense. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so in terms of what you'll need to do as an applicant, then you'll need to register and apply for core psychiatry. It's possible that we'll have some queries about your applications, uh, your application. So you might receive some emails from us to just clarify a few points. Um, you'll need to um, book, you will need to set up yourself an account in order to be able to book the multi-specialty recruitment assessment. And then you'll then need to book a specific slot at a time, can, time and location convenient to you. Um, you'll need to complete your preferences to say which posts you would prefer ahead of other posts um, and then eventually hopefully should you be successful you'll need to respond to offers um, so next slide please um, so um, there's one application and there's probably up to 500 vacancies I think if anything that's probably an underestimate um, so to be really clear we're recruiting for England Scotland Wales and Northern Ireland um, this year they normally run a separate process but they're joining us um, for this round um, in England um, there's both core psychiatry options and also um, child and adolescent psychiatry, which is a run through pilot. So as in, if you opt for that option, um, then you would not have to apply at SD4 for child and adolescent psychiatry. You would run right through um, to CCT. Um, in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, they only have core um, psychiatry posts. I put the indicative um, vacancies there at the moment. Um, they are available on our website. They probably will change quite a bit during um, the process. Um, and later down the line, when you come to preference, they'll be more accurate. Um, but I think those figures um, look fairly in keeping with the numbers that we've had previously. And if anything, I'd suspect they'll increase rather than decrease. Um, so move on to the next slide. Um, I'm just going to briefly cover the eligibility requirements, which hopefully you're all aware of. Um, there is a standardised person specification. Um, and so you'll need to have a primary medical qualification. You need to be eligible for full GMC registration. Um, with a current license to practice at the point you take up the post if you're currently um, overseas and you've given up your license to practice until you come back to the UK for instance that's absolutely fine you need to have 24 months experience um, so equivalent to the UK foundation program um, and of that experience 12 months of it's uh, 12 months of it needs to be a post full GMC um, registration level or equivalent um, you need to be eligible to work in the UK, but actually all medical practitioner jobs are currently on the shortage occupation list. Um, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem. You need to be able to evidence your English language skills and you'll need to be able to evidence that you either have foundation competencies that is, or you're on track to get them um, by August, 2021. Um, there's absolutely no limit on the amount of previous psychiatry experience you can have. So if you've got lots already, then that isn't a barrier to applying. Um, next slide, please. So how to apply. You need to apply um, via the Oriel system. Some of you will be aware that there's currently a kind of hybrid situation where there's Oriel 1 and Oriel 2. It's a new version of Oriel that you need to apply on, um, the links there. Um, and it does mean that you will need to, if you've got an account on the old version of Oriel, you will need to re-register um, for the new Oriel version um, before you can submit an application. Um, the only exception to that is if you've happened to have applied for an academic clinical fellowship um, the vacancies for those closed yesterday so if you've done that then you will just be able to apply straight away um, and as I've already said um, it's one one application you can be considered for all the posts in England Scotland Wales and Northern Ireland for both core psychiatry and in England um, child and adolescent psychiatry run through as well um, the application window opened this morning um, and it will close at 4 p.m uk time on Tuesday the 1st of December um, do make sure you give yourself enough time to be sure that you're going to complete the application. Um, we don't accept late applications and we won't extend the deadline. Um, so do bear that in mind and attempt to submit some somewhat before four o'clock on the 1st of December. Um, we've got an applicant's guide. There's more information for you there. Um, next slide, please. So the application form itself is relatively straightforward. You'll be asked um, personal information, name, address, contact details, that kind of thing. You need to give details about your primary medical qualification and your employment details to date. Um, you'll be asked to provide details of referees um, at this stage, but we don't take up references until you've accepted an offer. So that's quite far down the line. There are no white space box questions, by which I mean there are no kind of points where you have to write a little essay about why you want to choose a career in psychiatry, for instance, they are all basic kind of straightforward questions. Um, 
The next bullet point I'm going to cover a little bit more um, in a few slides going forward, but depending on your circumstances, you might need to provide some supporting evidence, um, but the application should prompt you if you need to attach your evidence, depending on how you answer certain things. Um, once you've submitted your application, you're, it will be long listed to check that you meet all the criteria we've already gone through. Um, and during that period, which is basically from the point at which you submit your application up until the first couple of weeks in December, um, you should be making sure that you're checking your Oriole account in case there are any messages from us saying, please clarify X, because there'll be a deadline on that request to respond and, and you need to respond in time in order to make sure that your um, application carries on through the process. Um, at the end of the long listing process, um, everyone who has been successfully long listed will get a message to confirm that that's the case. Um, there are dates further on in the in the slides, which will tell you exactly when, but you should hear from us um, by the middle of December to say that your application is moving forward. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so as I was saying, there are some instances where you might need to provide a bit of extra information, and I've just highlighted the key ones here. There might be a few more, but I think they'd be quite unlikely circumstances. So hopefully the ones I've picked out are things that will be um, useful for you to know about. So if you um, are going to need um, any kind of adjustments to help you take the MSRA, um, for instance, you have dyslexia, then you'll need to provide evidence to us to show that, to, to support that. So for instance, if you did have dyslexia and you want to have 25% extra time in the MSRA, then we'd need to see your educational psychologist report re recommending that you should be given 25% extra time in exams. Um, special circumstances might well not apply to that many people, um, but if it does apply to you, then um, please note this information. So if you're the primary carer for someone who is disabled, or if you've got a medical condition or disability where you need to have um, treatment in a very specific location, then you need to submit a form to the email address that's there by the closing date for applications, which, as I've said before, is the 1st of December at four o'clock. Um, and if you have special circumstances approved, then you um, will be um, allocated ahead of other people because you need to, you've got, you've demonstrated that you do need to remain in that area. Um, so next slide, please. Um, a very few of you, if you've previously applied um, to core psychiatry and you've since um, been released from or resigned from it, then you need to get a form completed and you need to get that form signed off by your previous um, school of psychiatry. So um, if that, if you think that applies to you, please do check that form out um, as soon as you can, because it might take you a little bit of time to get the form signed off I and mean, you'll need it for your application to pro progress. Um, if you have to answer yes to any of the fitness to practice um, questions, then again, there's a form that you'll need to complete um, to provide us with further details about it. Um, fitness to practice, though, is we, we collect the information, but it won't affect your eligibility in most instances. So it, it's just so that we've got it so that we can pass it on to your eventual employer. Um, and then foundation competence evidence. If you're not currently in a UK affiliated foundation year two post, um, then you'll either need to attach evidence that you've completed foundation in the last three and a half years or um, submit a form that shows that you've got equivalent competence. I'm going to talk about a little bit that a little bit on the next slide, I think. So can I have the next slide, please? Oh, yes, is this slide. Good. Um, so if you are currently in a UK foundation programme, then it's fairly straightforward. Um, you just need to say the name of your foundation school in your application and you don't need to provide any further evidence. Um, similarly, if you're currently in core training or specialty training of any description in the UK and you've got either a DRN, which is deanery reference number, or an NTN, which is a national training number, you can add that into the um, application form and the specialty and we'll be able to see from your employment history that that's the case. You don't need to provide anything further to show that you've got foundation competence. Um, if you've completed foundation training in the last three and a half years, so since the 1st of January 2018, um, then you should have a certificate, your foundation programme certificate of completion that you can upload and attach to your um, application form so that we can see that you've got that. Um, if you completed foundation training more than three and a half years ago, um, you don't fall into any of the other categories above or you're not currently in training, um, then you'll need to provide a certificate of readiness to enter specialty training. Um, so there's a bit more detail about that on the next slide. Um, so it just maps to the foundation program curricul curriculum, sorry, and it will need to be signed off by someone who's supervised you for a continuous period of three months since the 1st of January 2018. So an educational or clinical supervisor. Um, do make sure that you're using the 2021 version of the Crest. Um, it's been changed since 2020. Um, so we can't accept old versions, unfortunately. Um, and um, 
make sure you read all the guidance um, on the specialty training website. There's quite a lot of stuff about how, how exactly you need to complete it. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so then the final bit on the application form is there's a little bit of information where we collect it, but we're not really focusing on it from a kind of recruitment point of view. Um, so we'll, we'll pass it on um, when you're successful and that with the idea that your new employer or your new uh, training region will get in touch with you to say, like, oh, we noticed you've asked this, so now you need to do this. Um, so the type of thing I'm talking about are if you want to defer, then you can request to defer on your application form um, for statutory reasons, such as ill health or shared parental leave, that kind of thing. But we, it, it, it has no bearing on your application itself. Similarly, if you want to request to um, train less than full time, that information is collected, but it's only once you are allocated to a post that you would need to apply to have your less than full time training um, confirmed. Um, some of you might have um, experience um, in another specialty um, that you'd like to put towards your core psychiatry training to shorten it. So that's the accreditation of transferable competences framework. Again, you can indicate that on the form, but it doesn't have any bearing on the recruitment process itself. Um, if you are um, going to need a tier two visa, which is shortly becoming a skilled, a skilled worker visa, I think, um, then again, you can indicate that on the form. And once you're appointed, then the central um, sponsors for England, Scotland and Wales, Northern Ireland, they've all got separate um, sponsorship arrangements, will contact you and provide you with the forms and what you need to do next so that you get the right bit of paper so that you can apply for the Home Office so that your um, visa is sorted out by August 2021. Um, there's an additional question this year which asks about if you're new to the NHS, um, you can say you can opt in or, or recently joined the NHS, you can opt in to say yes, some um, regions and some colleges in the GMC run specific training aimed at international medical graduates. Um, so if that sounds um, like it's you, then you can opt into that and you might be contacted later down the line and once you've accepted a post. Um, so next slide, please. And then, so I suppose what I should have said on the previous slide is that's basically everything I think you need to know about the application uh, in advance or you know right now while you're applying. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the multi-specialty recruitment assessment, um, and I think that Charlotte's going to talk a little bit more about it after me. Um, so it's a computer-based test, and it is the only thing that we're going to use to um, rank you for August 2021. Um, it's used by a number of specialties, so if you are applying for other things other than core psychiatry, you do only need to sit it once and it'll count for all those applications. There are two papers as standards, and, as standard, and we'll use both of them. Um, the combined score from both of them in order to create your final um, interview score ranking. Um, so the first one is the Professional Dilemmas paper, which focuses on your approach to practicing medicine. Um, and then the second one is the Clinical Problem Solving paper, which um, shows you a number of clinical scenarios and wants you to exercise judgment and problem, problem solving skills to determine appropriate diagnosis and management of patients. Um, so next slide, please. On the kind of practical um, stuff related to the multi-specialty recruitment, um, as long as you're eligible and you're long listed, then you will be invited to sit the MSRA test. If you've sat the MSRA test this year or in a previous year, um, then I'm afraid you do need to sit it again. Um, we expect currently that the MSRA is going to be taking place between the 28th of January and the 12th of February um, at P Pearson View Test Centres, both globally. And then there are um, well, both in different, there's lots and lots of venues in the UK. There are also um, venues globally, um, although not necessarily absolutely everywhere. Um, we obviously are aware that we're currently in a pan pandemic. So there are arrangements that can be put in place um, for people who are unable to attend um, testing centres for, for any, any number of reasons. Um, so for instance, if you're isolating or shielding in line with government or public health advice due to COVID-19, or if depending on your geographical location, if there's a, a local lockdown, or if you're unable to travel outside of your country to attend the nearest centre, um, then we can make arrangements so that you can sit um, the MSRA online from the, from the comfort of your home. Um, um, but in the first instance, you'll be invited to, to go to a test centre. And if you're not able to do that, then you'll need to fill in a form to request to sit elsewhere your home. Um, potentially, if there is significant disruption to testing during this window because of COVID-19, then um, everyone will be asked to sit the MSRA online um, and it will be both papers and that's what we we'll use to um, score you. Um, there's a link there that's got more information about how to prepare for the MSRA 
um, and I think that Charlotte's going to cover a bit that in a bit more detail later too. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so as I've already said, we've got anticipated vacancy numbers on our website, um, and they'll probably fluctuate between now and when we make offers. And um, when you come to preference, you'll have a better idea of where exactly the posts are and what information we've got about them. But again, the actual post numbers might vary a little bit. Um, up until the point when you're offered posts. Um, we're thinking at the moment that you'll be able to indicate which particular post you're um, most hoping to be appointed to between about the 9th of February and the 26th of February. Um, then in terms of whether you're eligible for an offer, you need to make sure you score um, the minimum on both MSRA papers to be eligible for a post offer. Um, and then just to reiterate, you, there are no interviews the only thing we're offering on is the MSRA score alone, and it is both papers. Um, no other further information is going to be considered for this round of recruitment. Um, we're planning to make initial offers um, by the 2nd of March, and as standard, you get 48 hours to respond to offers, although that excludes weekends, so you might get slightly longer depending on when you made your offer. Um, initially, you'll be able to accept, decline, or hold your offer. If you hold your offer, that's, that's the kind of option for people who might be waiting to hear from another specialty. Um, the whole deadline is the 28th of April. If you're made an offer after that date, then you'd only get the option to accept or decline the offer. Um, we make kind of offers in cycles. So at some point on the 2nd of March, we'll make the first set of offers um, and we'd expect a number of people to decline or, or reject their offers um, so that there'll be more offers that we can make 48 hours later, which would be Thursday, the 4th of March. We'll carry on in that kind of iterative process until as many of the posts are filled or we've got no remaining appointable applicants to offer them to. Um, so next slide. Um, I won't go through this slide in detail because I think it's available all on our on our website and I've mentioned the dates, but here are the key dates. I guess I'd like to stress to you that if you are thinking of applying for course psychiatry, then the deadline again is um, the 1st of December at four o'clock. Um, the long listing is taking place from as soon as people start submitting applications um, and will definitely be completely wrapped up by this 22nd of December, but most likely um, you'll hear from us slightly in advance of that date. Um, shortly after the application window closes, then um, you'll be sent a request to set up a an account so that you can, so that you'll be able to book on to the MSRA, but it's not a request to book the MSRA at that point, that comes later. Um, as by the 5th of January, it might possibly be earlier than that, I don't know, but we'll keep we'll keep you posted. Um, that invitation to the MSRA is you'll be sent the link and then you'll be kind of, via your account, you'll be given access to all the available MSRA um, locations and dates and you can pick the one that's closest to you and at the most suitable time. Um, the preferencing window I've already mentioned and when offers are released, I've mentioned, and then the, f the start date is the first Wednesday in August as usual. Um, so next slide. And then, yeah, next slide, I think. Um, so there are some useful links there. We'll um, be able to provide them to you afterwards. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to ask questions at the end of it, and you can be doing that via the chat function now. Um, and just to reiterate that we do have our own email address. It's there if you want to ask something really specific to you and not sort of ask it publicly. Um, so hopefully you found that useful. Um, thanks very much. Ahead, Artie. Thank you so much, Claire. That was a lot of information in a very short space of time. And actually, I was monitoring the questions as uh, you were talking through them, and quite a few of them, I think, were answered by your uh, by your slides, by what you said. Um, there are a few things definitely that people still want to talk about. So um, I'm really glad you're staying around um, for the panel questions at the end, and I'll pass some of those questions to you. Um, but before we start the panel uh, question and answer, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Charlotte Blewett, who is a consultant psychiatrist at Sheffield Health and Social Care Trust. She's the recruitment lead uh, for Trent Division and she's also the lead psychiatry writer for the recruitment lead for Trent Division and she's also the lead psychiatry writer for the recruitment lead I'm also going to introduce uh, Emma Brooks, who's a core, who's a CTC, who's a social health 
doing a awesome talk with her, and she'll be doing a like a core trainee. Hi, thank you, everybody. Um, so, as Artie's already mentioned, I am I'm Charlotte Blewett. I'm one of the consultants based in Sheffield, and I have been involved in the MRS, um, MSRA writing process for the last couple of years. So, I will do my best to cover that briefly in this talk, and then answer any questions about that later on. But as a relatively new consultant, one of the things I was asked to talk about this afternoon was how. Um, trainers and consultants can best support their potential trainees in their application. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. So this is going to be a relatively brief talk, but just to explain, firstly, looking at things from what does your psychiatry trainee offer for the place for you and for the placement. So one thing I think is really important to take account of when um, with foundation trainees and people who are thinking of applying to psychiatry, if you're doing a psychiatry post, um, at foundation level, it's probably the first time you've actually physically been working in a psychiatric environment outside of your placements at medical school. And for a lot of our IMGs, potentially the first time working in the NHS. So being aware of, of those things and considering that when you're thinking about when somebody starts in the post and what their training needs might be. When you're thinking about the post itself, what training opportunities does it offer for people who are thinking of applying to core psychiatry? So we, there's a lot of um, key skills for reaching foundation programme competencies and specific skills that will meet the CT1 personal specification, which will be available and is already on the available on the Northwest um, recruitment website, as Claire was saying. So there'll be lots of things that are covered in your placements, such as around organisation and team working, but also quite specific skills that psychiatry will offer to meet those subspecialities, those uh, specifications. And then expanding that more, thinking about what your trainee might want in terms of unique training opportunities. So, for example, I work in a community post, but there might be opportunities for my trainees to spend some time working in inpatient psychiatry or some of the other specialities. Um, because we know that psychiatry is a very varied and uh, wide speciality, and it can be really important to get that exposure so people know that really understand what they're applying for, but also the potential of their options. So I did a very different post as a foundation trainee to the post that I'm now working in now as a consultant and just making sure that's clear for, for your trainee. The other thing that I think is really important thinking about foundation level and, and newer trainees who are thinking about applying to psychiatry is thinking about tailoring their induction to the department. So working in um, a psychiatry ward can be very different to working in a general medical ward. And alongside that, how the on-call process is, which again can be very different compared to working in the acute trust with surgical and medical wards. So are people prepared for on-calls? Do they know who to contact when you're needing more advice and support? And how can we best make sure that trainees are supported during that time? And finally, um, the other thing that for me as a trainer that's really key is making sure that your supervision time with your trainee is protected and job planned in for the both of you and that they have wider support from the MDT. So other specialty doctors and other higher trainees and core trainees and potentially other therapists and senior practitioners in the team to make sure that they get a really, really excellent experience of psychiatry and, and go on to complete the application. So next slide, please. So I think this is really important thinking about what does your trainee offer? And that was something Emma and I had had a conversation about. Um, and it's really important to get to know your trainee. I can't emphasize that enough. And also from your trainee side, really getting to understand and get to know your supervisor. What's brought them to think about applying to psychiatry in the first place? What's made them interested in the speciality? Have they got a definite clear career path? I certainly didn't when I was applying for CT1. So thinking about how you might get some more information and some ideas about that. So whether that's that they're thinking about a definite specific subspeciality or that they want to spend some more time in other areas of psychiatry. And also thinking about outside of psychiatry, we've just come working through a really, really busy time in the NHS and incredibly stressful with everything that's been going on with the pandemic and COVID. Uh, do your trainees have a good time outside of work to take on different other interests that are really important to avoid burnout and really important, which makes them a really rounded, interesting train that you want to have on the programme. And then next slide, please. So 
this was just to talk, I just want to talk about how you consultants can actually support the application process. So this year is going to be very, very different because of COVID. Um, so firstly, as Claire's already outlined in quite a lot of detail, the application window itself. So we know that's now just open for call psychiatry today and that's going to be shutting um, right at the beginning of December. So being aware of that and making sure your trainees who are thinking of applying are also aware and what links they might need to be able to fill in the application form and thinking about making sure that you've given them as much um, opportunities to meet that personal specification as much as possible. A lot of um, foundation posts um, and posts that people who are applying for CT1 in psychiatry tend to be quite um, around centred around inpatient and community teams. But there may be specific subspecialities we know that people are really interested in that could be things like perinatal and eating disorders, disorders and forensics. So think about offering, if you can't offer that taste today, can somebody else that you know offer that taste today and making sure that your foundation trainees and other trainees are actually using their taste todays so they can get to know and get to explore that area of psychiatry. We know that the MSRA is going to be um, now the significant part of the process for this round of, um, of, of applications. So can making sure that your trainees have adequate time to prepare for this. Um, um, for trainees, particularly within the foundation programme, majority will have pre-allocated study leave that's taken up with a variety of different training days that they need to complete to reach those foundation competencies. So can you be potentially more flexible within their job plan about offering them potentially more time for private study and preparation for MSRA, which I think is going to be really key, particularly for trainees this year, given the changes in the process going on. And then if we move to the next slide, please. So finally, um, with the MSRA. Now, this is obviously going to be a really um, important topic to discuss, given the changes that have happened with the recruitment this, this time and that's been needed because of COVID. So the MSRA itself is already in place and has been used in psychiatry as part of the process, recruitment process for the last few years. And it's also used extensively in other specialities. GP had been using it for many, many years, but it's also been taken on by ops and gynae, ophthalmology, neurosurgery. Um, and there's a few I'm missing out, but it's you'll find now that the vast majority of specialities are using the test. And as um, as Claire had already mentioned, it's a very good way. It's a significant evidence and the way it works in providing a valid standardised test for recruitment. But also there's significant evidence now we've seen from the trainees that applied into the MRSA a couple of years ago, MSRA a couple of years ago, that they are successfully moving through not just core um, psychiatry training, but also then subsequent success in completing their MRC psych exams and then being able to apply for higher training. So we know that um, that's the evidence base shows that it does work and that that is as effective at potentially being used as a recruitment um, uh, programme. Now there's two parts of the MSRA. So there's the um, clinical problem solving. Now, um, uh, Claire mentioned this briefly, this is based at foundation competency level. And both parts of the test are a mixture of MCQs that will be single best answer, ranking or extended matching questions. The clinical problem solving is very similar to some of the um, questions you may have encountered at med school exams, and it will cover a variety of the medical specialities of different clinical scenarios that you'll be asked questions on uh, based on different levels of knowledge recall. And I, I have to say that having written questions for psychiatry for that part of the test, that's generally the, the one that people feel most comfortable with in terms of it feels most similar to the tests that they may have done before whilst at medical school. The professional dilemmas, which uses a situational judgment format, um, are based on competencies that are being examined, which directly relate to the generic professional capabilities framework, which is outlined by the GMRC. So these are capabilities that all doctors are required um, to be have evidence. Um, so that will be things around sensitivity and empathy and coping under pressure. Um, from working through and writing questions for this, this tends to be the side of the, um, the exam that people find more challenging. And it's certainly the one that I, I would recommend that you spend plenty of time preparing for and getting to understand what's going on because that's something that really is um, benefit from having more practice through. Um, so what, even how different this year is, one of the things that I mentioned below is thinking about for people that 
the best way to prepare for the MRSA is allowing yourself plenty of time to prepare and allowing yourself plenty of time to practice. So do approach your local education departments, do approach your TPD or your DMEs to ask for potentially options for funding, for resources for, for you to prepare. There are various question banks and various websites out there are offering um, different ways to prepare for the exam. And I know there's costs implicated in those. So do approach your trust to see if there's any possibility of you uh, receiving a, access for these. And finally, from a, from a trainer's perspective, I think it's really key that if somebody was sitting the MRC psych exam, they would, we would make sure that they had exam leave to attend the exam. So make sure that your trainee has that exam booked in early um, and that you know when they're sitting it and you know that they've got the appropriate leave in place to do that. So they feel supported and valued and as best as they can be before they sit the exam. Um, I'm happy to take questions about um, uh, the MSRA later in the Q&A section. Um, because I know there'll be obviously something that's going to be on people's minds at the moment. But as I say, I can reiterate, having written questions on it for um, five years, it is a very thoroughly researched and fair exam. Um, and it has um, contributions from all the specialities that are involved in um, using it for recruitment. Um, and it's very, very heavily um, monitored and checked in terms of its fairness. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I'm now going to introduce, introduce Emma Brooks, who's a CT3, uh, also working in Sheffield, to talk to you um, about uh, working as a core trainer. Emma Brooks, who's a CT3, uh, also working in Sheffield, to talk to you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so my name's Emma, I'm a core trainee. Um, I had a bit of a scenic route myself into core training, so I just wanted to offer uh, a bit of information about where your trainees might be coming from and the journeys they've been on, uh, and then also just a few tips both for trainees and for trainers uh, in terms of supporting them in their kind of journey into core training. So next slide, please. So I've just put here some information that's from the Foundation Year Destination Survey. So this is a survey that's sent out to all Foundation doctors towards the end of their F2 year, finding out where they're gonna go when they finish. Um, so if I direct your attention to the pie chart on the left, so you can see that 37% um, are planning on attending specialty training in the UK or planning on applying for specialty training. Um, and then two smaller but still quite significant chunks, are uh, trainees that are looking to take a career break and also those that are looking to work as locums appointed for service, which comes in a variety of forms which I'll talk about uh, and then there's a few other kind of options um, that that people can have um, outside of specialty, specialty training and that number of 37% is falling so you'll see on the graph on the right hand side year on year the number of trainees that are going straight into training um, is dropping and who knows what's going to happen in 2020 I guess it remains to be seen the impact of, of COVID on the application numbers uh, but certainly doctors are deciding to take more time out for various reasons um, so if I have the next slide, please. Uh, so this is just some of the options um, that I know of in, in my cohort and myself that they've done uh, rather than going straight into core training from foundation years. So there are lots of options for clinical fellow posts and that's both in and outside of psychiatry. Um, that can be useful for those that are kind of on the fence about what specialty they want to work in. There's those that decide just to do ad hoc locum work. Um, so they'll pick up jobs in various specialties again might be psychiatry might not be there's those that come out of medicine completely for a year uh, they might do some medical education work charity work journalism uh, medical technology all kinds of different different things that will enhance their um it will really enrich their what they offer as a trainee um but isn't kind of the very typical route that we might expect them to take they might come from another specialty and um, so particularly gp for example there's there's some trainees that will change their mind and and come to psychiatry from other places and also spending time abroad as well. So really a huge wealth of experiences that your trainees will come to you um, with. So next slide, please. Uh, so, so of course, you know, the interview process this year, the application process this year, sorry, is different. So there's no interview. Um, I just wanted to kind of offer my reassurances as someone who sat the MSRA that it does feel like a very fair exam. Um, I had 
a few years out of, of medical training. I did a local service job and uh, and then a year out of medicine completely. And I'd, I'd recommend definitely looking into some maybe question banks that are online. You can have a look, see if any of them will suit you. There's certainly um, practice questions available if you look at the MSRA website itself. Really get to grips with the format of the exam. Some of the clinical dilemmas, uh, you know, kind of questions are based on things that I hadn't encountered since medical school. So to really give yourself the best chance, I think it is worth revising for um, and really trying to prepare. Next slide, please. And in terms of trainers and um, how you can support foundation doctors and those that are outside of foundation training and applying to psychiatry, like Charlotte says, I think the really the biggest thing for me was having trainers that got to know me and what I wanted to do, took an interest in what I was doing in my years out. I uh, didn't see it as a bad thing <laughs> sometimes. You know, and I can I can think of one or two consultants who really made a huge impact on me just from getting to know uh, what I was about and keeping in touch as well. So if you've got a foundation year one or foundation year two trainee who's thinking about psychiatry, um, just being there as a friendly face who they can email if they've got any questions or they want to arrange something uh, that can really make a, a big difference as well in terms of how confident they're feeling um, when they're coming to apply for psychiatry. And also help with application, not necessarily application to core training, but look, you know, thinking more longitudinally, there's things that they can get involved in. Can you have them help with audits that you're doing on your ward or in your community? Can you help them arrange shadowing and taster days? Um, like Charlotte says, often foundation posts are on inpatient wards and of course psychiatry offers a huge breadth of experience beyond that. So can you help arrange that for them with your contacts? Are there local conferences that they will be able to attend and obviously have appropriate study leave to go to those and, and your support um, and if you've got a trainee that has been out of foundation years for a while they've been out of training support with the crest itself just having that kind of enthusiasm to help get them signed off and things that they need to be signed off with can just make a really big difference um, interview advice I guess is less relevant this year um, but certainly the MSRA questions are the professional dilemmas like Charlotte was saying a lot of people can struggle with that one um, and as trainers, you're going to have a huge amount of experience and um, a lot of advice you'll be able to offer to maybe talk through some of those scenarios with your trainees and help them uh, get to grips with those kind of questions. Um, and also for me as well, I think having a trainer provide access to some really friendly core trainees that I was able to have as an ally was really useful. Um, just somebody that's been through the process quite recently and can offer, you know, logistical advice. Um, I mean, in terms of the actual application process itself, I think most trainees will know, apply on time, um, you know, don't leave it till the last minute because it does slow down, the system does slow down, there is a, a risk of your application not going through. Um, just a, a little tip from for applicants from me is that you can set your notifications up when you sign up for Oriel to email you when your status changes, I'd recommend doing that. Um, just because at any time anything is updated on your um, application, you get an email and it's a bit easier to keep on top of. Um, but yeah, certainly uh, applying early and having having a friendly core trainee who's been through it recently can just um, help you feel a bit more relaxed when you when uh, applica applications are going through. So um, that would be my advice. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Emma and Charlotte. Um, I think you've answered quite a few questions, Charlotte, in your uh, presentation about uh, what people were asking about, but there's still, um, as we anticipated, um, a lot of questions about uh, the MSRA, but also the application process. Um, I've been trying to gather themes as we've uh, gone along, and there's been quite a few questions about visas uh, applying from abroad and visa um, uh, sort of linked visas, uh, spousal visas, things like that. I think for those questions, it would be best to um, approach the Home Office and ask the Home Office, um, because I'm not sure. Claire, I'll check with you. Shake your head or nod your head if you can answer any questions about visa. Um, uh, kind of visas and things like that? Not 
no we can't really and we definitely can't provide immigration advice the only thing i'd say is i think on the specialty training website there is a section that's aimed at overseas applicants and there's quite a bit of information there so that might be somewhere to look that's more kind of targeted at junior doctors as well as the home office thank you claire um, one of the questions was about the DR, uh, well, a few questions were about the DRN um, and uh, applicants were asking where they could find the uh, DRN on either their foundation uh, portfolio or wh where they'd find it. Claire, would you be able to answer that, please? Um, can I ask Amelia to answer this question for me? Because I think she knows more about it than I do. <laughs> uh when they complete the application form, they'll have the opportunity to include their foundation school. Um, and if they can get the NTN from uh, their deanery from their local region, they can include that as well. Um, but we don't think, as far as we could tell live on the call, we don't, you can bypass it. If you don't have it available, yeah. you can admit it. The key thing for us is to see that you are in a UK um, foundation school and there's a drop down list. So if you select that and your employment history makes it look like you're in foundation, then that will be totally fine. So don't worry about it too much. Claire, uh, again, as well, you might be able to answer this, you might not. Uh, on average, what is the ratio of applicants to positions available, uh, please? We can only kind of do it globally um, because we can't, because people can change their preferences all through the process. Um, I think, I mean, I think the main thing to say is that in round one for August, we've never filled all the available posts so um there tend to be more posts than appointable applicants by the time we've got through the whole process so hopefully it's quite reassuring i mean i think it depends a little bit on where you want to end up working i'd say london and, and bristol are more competitive areas compared to say perhaps mm. the north of england but but yeah overall there are more posts than there are applicants thank you claire um, I know there's another question as well about do people end up without posts and uh, certainly in my experience when I've been interviewing and recruiting previously we've always ended up with mo more vacant posts than we have had applicants um, uh, but it's nice to hear that from you as well Claire thank you. Um, another question about the uh, MSRA um, there was a question early on that um, from one of the uh, one of the attendants saying that they'd heard that GP people who are applying for GP get first go at the MSRA you're shaking your head so that's not true then Everyone no so basically the invitations are all sent out on the same day and I think generally within an hour of each other um it is true that um the, the available slots are kind of first come first serve so you do want to have a look and book your slot as soon as you can but the GP's don't get any advantage so don't worry about that too much <laughs> and do you and do you need to pay for the msra nope it's completely free okay thank you very much um there's some some specific questions about um specific deaneries um doc the question for you charlotte Dr. Blewett, uh, would you recommend any websites or resources besides oh, the MSRA? Dr. Blewett, uh, would you recommend any websites or resources besides the MSRA? Uh, mm, well, I mean, I'm not, I can categorically say I'm not sponsored by anybody and I'm not, um, I don't know. so, I mean, it, it, it will be, there is past medicine, I know, we'll have a question back, I think it's four months access. Um, I think on examination does one. Well, I'm looking at Emma for a yeah. bit of a, a confirming. Yeah, this again. Um, I don't. Can you share your login or is um, it? Not, I don't think it's that, it's some, not sure if you Yeah, can. I think uh, that that's some. Sometimes it's well, that's why I was mentioning about approaching your, your DME and your your med, med department to see if sometimes if you if they know a group is sitting, they may pay a number of logins for a period if it's going to be financially difficult. Um, Past medicine and on examination, I think probably have got the most, they've been running the most question banks for the longest. That's probably where I'd go to start with. Um, the end is you're doing things online as well, rather than going to books is it's it's pretty, um, you find it's the most up-to-date stuff. It's easier to fit in if you get spare, there's downtime at work and it just fits in better than your job plan. And it's like any exam or any test approach, it's far better to do little and often in the months building up 
um, and then obviously doing a bit more questions to the exam. But it's really you, uh, to reiterate the, the, the clinical problem solving part of the test, you will, majority of people, even somebody as me who has been a psychiatrist for a while, find that the, the kind of all the other subspecialities within it, I was able to answer the questions on it to make common sense. The, the thing to spend the time really focusing on is the professional dilemmas element because that will be more of a kind of skill I suppose of learning to get used to doing those questions but it's it's something that just as up, the more you do it the easier it will be. Thanks Charlotte. Arty you're on um, mute. Sorry about that. Um, thanks, Charlotte. Um, there, there's been a few questions about um, the weighting of the questions. Are professional dilemmas and clinical scenarios, are they weighted equally? Charlotte, I'll go to you first. Sorry, I've unmuted it yet. So yeah, they're, they're, they're equally weighted. So you, as, as Claire mentioned, you have to get um, an appropriate raw score on each side of the paper, but there, it's not that one paper is rated any more than the other, it's equal, equal balance. Thanks, Charlotte. There's been quite a few questions about uh, deferment, um, deferring for six months, a year, longer than that. Also, how long, if you sit the MSRA now, how long does that, is that valid for? Could you sit the MSRA, uh, MSRA now? Um, and apply later, or could you apply now and defer for later? Claire, would you be able to answer that, please? Um, I can. I think it's a little bit tricky um, just because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Usually, if you take um, the MSRA in January, um, then that would also count for um, any application you wanted to make for the following February, so for the August entry and then the February entry. I think just because it's MSRA only, it's possible that there might be slightly different rules. So, so I'm only focusing on this round. So it's it's definitely valid for this round. Beyond that, I think we'll have to confirm in due course. That's okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Also, no, no, that's absolutely fine. I think that also answers a question about somebody who is intending to apply in a couple of years. Um, and what does non-COVID recruitment look like? Well, I've done pre-COVID, I'm not going to say non-COVID, I'm going to say pre-COVID recruitment for over 10 years now and it did, did involve interviews and different stations and things like that um, and the SJT has been brought in more re recently. Um, I have to say post-COVID, um, I, I, we don't know. So um, I mean COVID may be gone in six months, a year, two years, we don't know. So if you're applying in two years time, I'm afraid we can't really say that we're going to go back to interviews, either face to face, telephone, video, or what balance of SJT and MSRA it's going to be, because I just don't think we know enough to be able to make that decision. Is that fair, Claire? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. OK, um, just having a look about there's quite a few questions about particular geographies, which I'm probably not going to get to now, just because um, I know there's lots of people uh, on the call. Um, there is, I'm just looking, I know there's, there was quite a lot of, I think it's a really difficult question for you both to answer. Um, you've both covered it, Charlotte and Claire. There's understandably a lot of dissatisfaction from um, people who have prepared the CVs. They've got lots of um, extracurricular and extra experience in psychiatry and understandably they feel um, disappointed um, because this ha this isn't being counted. Um, what I would say is that that's still important, um, that, what, that time and effort you've put into building your CV hasn't been wasted. I know it's it's, it won't be counted at this point in your application, but it certainly will be important in the rest of your career in influencing what jobs you choose and other things like that. I wondered, Charlotte, because as you and Emma have both had, as you said, a little bit of a circuitous route into psychiatry, haven't you? And I think you're both really good examples of how doing different things and whether it's building your CV or just doing different things can still add to what you're doing or your role as a psychiatrist.
Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a difficult situation that we're in. And I really want to empathise and sympathise with everybody that's involved that I, who spent significant amounts of time preparing their portfolios and their CVs for their psychiatry applications. Um, I totally appreciate how difficult the situation is it, that everybody is in. And I mean, I, have, I wasn't involved in, in, in any way directly in, in the decision about the MSRA, but it's something that has been taken over a lot of consideration and a lot of thought of the safest and fairest way at the moment to do, to do an assessment in the recruitment side of things. Um, what I would say is if, you've, if you are, and, it, and I'm sure there'll be lots of people on this call who spent, who've been doing all that preparation work, that will reflect in your MSRA, in particularly in the professional dilemmas element of it, because the fact that you spent time developing yourself and being a well-rounded person will be reflected into those questions that are being asked of you. So you will find that that means you will perform better in the MSRA, just to reiterate that. Um, but also that this is a process that's getting you into the career hope that you want to do and all those extra things that you've done to prepare yourself for psychiatry will mean that you'll get a lot more out of the core training program um, and also be able to kind of hit the ground running when you first start in terms of looking at different opportunities and developing your skill set and developing different areas in um, the psychiatry you're interested in, whether that's QI work and other clinical specialities and also in terms of other kind of management leadership opportunities. So that that preparation you've done will not go to waste and it will be reflected on um, the relation that you have with your supervisors and other trainees to come. But it also will reflect better on your MSRA score, Arista. And it's not, as I say, we don't know what's going to happen in the next round and, you know, as COVID continues and you know as it, the interview processes may come back but it's just to reiterate that that will mean a, a positive outcome for you further on I don't know if you wanted to add anything Emma. yeah I guess just to also obviously we don't know what's going to happen in a few years but thinking forward to higher training applications for the majority of people if there is an interview you're going to have the opportunity to show off your commitment to the specialty and that's when all of those amazing things that people have been putting all the effort into can also be shown off there as well um, I completely agree it doesn't mean that they're going to be forgotten about in any way or you know this guy's just they're going to be used in different ways when you're in your core training journey so um just to kind of reassure you that they, they, they will be used in the future for you you'll have the opportunity to show them off thank you thank you both thank you um I'm aware that we're coming up to the last couple of minutes of this. There's just um, a couple more questions, Claire, for you. Uh, I'll give you both of them at once, uh, but they're okay. separate questions. One is, uh, can you link um, can you link your application to somebody else's, as people have done at Foundation? If you're in a relationship, can you link your application to somebody else's? And secondly, um, can, if Northern Ireland has entered the process for the first time and uh, a few people have asked if they apply specifically for Northern Ireland is there a chance they will be placed somewhere else in the UK not Northern Ireland okay um sure um so linked applications unfortunately there isn't a way to link applications um for any specialty training it's too complicated we've not worked out a way to make it happen um if you are applying with someone else and you want to end up in the same place then our advice to you would be to make sure that you put your preferences in the same order in terms of location um and then um during the process when you start to be made offers um then you've got the opportunity then to update your preferences and where you might like to be so if your partner for instance is offered somewhere unexpected then you could reorder your preferences so that that's your top preference too um that's that's the best um kind of option available to you um in terms of northern ireland um you'll be able to source out your preferences so that you can say that you only are preferencing northern irish posts you can put all the english scottish and welsh posts in a column called not wanted and that would mean you would never be offered them at all um i mean the other thing is also you're offered them if you don't want the post you're under no obligation to accept it so um no we won't be sending anyone from northern ireland to the rest of the uk if they don't want to go <laughs> so thanks Thank you, Claire. Um, and it's now 4.59, so I just want to wrap up by saying thank you, of course, to all our speakers, to Claire, to Amelia, 
Scarlett and to Emma and also thank you to all the backroom staff um, at the Royal College, uh, Emma and Emily and Claire and Annie, who have insisted that they don't want their cameras on, so I'll respect that, but I know you're there and I know you, how hard you've worked to make today happen, so thank you so much uh, to everyone there. Um, I would for everyone else uh, who's attended today, thank you very much. Good luck with your applications. Um, any more information, as I said, there will be more FAQs and answers available on the website afterwards. And um, if there are any specific questions, please contact us either at the Royal College uh, or uh, Northwest Recruitment, who will probably be better at ask, answering some of your uh, specific questions about process issues. Uh, thank you, every, every, everyone. Have a good night and uh, stay safe. Bye.